Our next speaker tonight is Matthew Stender. Matthew is a technology ethicist, currently a project strategist with OnlineCensorship.org. And uh, tonight he's going to be talking to us about some of the different ways in which uh, social networks and other proprietary uh, platforms uh, use the data they've collected about us in uh, intrusive ways. So please give a welcome to Matthew Stender. Hello, everybody. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me and everyone here this evening. I know it's getting to that kind of twilight of camp. I hear there's a grappa flowing at the Italian embassy later, so you'll probably find me there after this. My name is Matthew Stinder. I am somewhat self-proclaimed a uh, technology, a uh, tech ethicist. Um, for the last year and a half, I've been researching around a central theme, and that is what are the cultural and ethical implications of emerging technology? And also, what does it mean to be human in the 21st century? I'm really interested in examining the social contract between us and the technology, us as humans, and the technology that we make, and how it has become more than just tools and is now becoming part of the way that we create an epistemic reality. That is, the, the information that we have, the knowledge that paints the picture of the world around us is now being very much influenced, nudged, and activated by systems. Tonight I'm going to be talking about proprietary platforms, but also proprietary algorithms, as opposed to um, open source technology, which we think most people this camp um, are well versed in, but I think sometimes we forget about what's going on in the propri proprietary world. What is it exactly that we're fighting? What is it exactly that corporations and, um, and governments are doing that we should maybe not just be, be wary of, um, but can actually take stances against? So I'm going to examine on, I guess we can call it tonight, a hashtag. Um, but it's, it's more than that. It's a theory um, which I've been working on for a while, and I call it MIMICS. And this is an acronym, initialism. It stands for Monitor, Index, Manipulate, Intercept, Sensor, and Silo. Right. I'm going to walk through these, uh, these letters and, and talk a little bit about um, what why, why I think it's important that we, uh, that we put some sort of communication strategy behind proprietariness and, and be able to relate it to people that are not so technically versed um, and have other people understand what it is that these systems are able to do in an untransparent process that affect the way that we live our lives. So once again, my name is Matthew Stender, and I'm going to talk about how, beyond this mimics concept, how platforms have really geared themselves up to be against humanity. So there's this uh, saying that art imitates life. But I think more and more that technology is mimicking reality. So. I'm going to start, with, I'm going to start uh, this, this talk with some kind of a, on a sociological slant, philosophical, if you will, um, and talk about um, just some basic things. This is kind of how I have come to see the world um, and try to also build uh, strategies around how to uh, communicate these things. So I think we all know we're surrounded by so much technology, and we have everything at our fingertips. But the problem is that this technology is not neutral. That a lot of it has, is capitalist driven. We have manufactured demand that gets us to voluntarily give away our information, but it's used for profit maximization. All the algorithms, the information that is more and more tailored and curated for, who the, for the us that these platforms think we are is in a constant state of evolution. Earlier today, I gave a talk on facial recognition technology. And one of the things that interests me about facial recognition technology is one image that we snap 
that may go to our iCloud or Google or Facebook, that we need a device to see it. We need battery in our phone in order to access this photo. It's not a human readable image first, only secondly. First is a machine readable image. And what I find particularly disturbing about this concept is that these images can continuously be churned, that new information, new data, new presumptions, new information can be accumulated on a single image each time that it's scanned inside of a large, of a large database. Um, and so we're now dealing with this, with this world that is, we have, so many, we have so many dynamic information points that have been taken from us or that we've given to technology companies. And this really t does, I believe, change the social relationship that we are able to experience with others. And changes the way that we ourselves are able to self-identify. So this is both an active and a passive influence on both our, our psychological and our sociological decision making. The things that I do, if I want to get those likes on that Instagram picture, I may pose in a way. I may go to the place in which that other people go. Um, this is for me to be able to put out a digital image to the world, but also get validation and gratification from others in responses of likes and comments. So Descartes, as is famous saying, but I want to interrogate if this is still true in the 21st century. Just because we think, are we there for? So let's start out with some kind of sociological, philosophical concepts. I'm really interested in agency, right? This idea for the capacity for individuals to act independently and make their own free choices. This is what I'm most concerned about with proprietary technology, that forces are being exerted onto us and in a way that we don't realize that our free will, that our free choice, that our agency is being outsourced or nudged upon. Confirmation bias. This is something that I also find interesting. That the more and more that we are exposed to proprietary platforms, we can think about it as social platforms now, the more that we're exposed to Facebook or to Instagram, that we, this does impact our epistemic reality. These are the things in which that we see that other people live their lives, the ways that other people live their lives, but it also then influences um, the w things that we hold to be true. So we're, we're searching, we're trying to interpret information. But a lot of times, as been shows, has been shown in, in uh, studies going back to the 70s, that the things that confirm our pre-existing beliefs are the easiest things for us to understand or, or choose to be what we consider fact or truth or objective reality. And so this idea of the illusion of control, that we overestimate our ability to control events, huh? that we think that we may actually, you know, this is, uh, uh, Langer is, is well known for this concept, dating back to the, the early days of the internet. And I think that even now, it's important for, for us to, to think about what degree do we have the ability to shape our world? And how much are we just a factor of the world pushing against us? And I mean, and finally, I think the last concept here, technological determinism. You know, does society, technology, drive development of its social structure and cultural values? And if so, what degree of influence does the proprietary technology have? When we don't have transparency, when we can't see inside source codes, when there are black boxes, when the systems that go through that each, each part of a machine learning algorithm, a neural network, a GAN, whatever it is, all these processes going on, we are not able to see what's inside and track back the outcome to the origin with a clear and meaningful causal uh, roadmap and surveillance capitalism. I, I probably most of y'all are, are familiar with uh, uh, Zibos um, from Harvard's uh, theory of surveillance capitalism. There's a book about it. But I think I thought this was interesting. I, I forget if, if how Verne's the f former or current chief economist, but this idea which that the chief economist for Google would say the ability to take data, to be able to understand it, to process it, to extract value from it, to visualize it, to communicate it, that it's going to be 
a hugely important skill in the next decades. So this, we can see now that, that somebody in charge of the monetization, the, the, finance, the revenue, the, the long-term economic prosperity of a company like Google that is more powerful than, than certain um, countries, if they're still looking, mapping out the next couple of decades to mine data, to, un to, tr to make their money off of our information, I think that we have to step back and say, okay, this is not an isolated phenomenon. We need to dig into this and also find ways to communicate to people that may have never thought that Facebook or, or somebody or your search feed, uh, your search results in Google may change how you see the world. Like Oscar Wilde said, it's very sad nowadays that there's so little useless information. I think this is particularly true in the digital era. So as I was saying, when we're surrounded by these things that, by, that confirm our confirmation bias, when we're exposed to things that do not create cognitive dissidence, when every day a feed in which we check consistently gives us similar information, it's sometimes hard to know what lies outside of these bubbles. So, MIT Technology Review is talking about these things. We see other world publications talking about how Google is the, is the future also see how technology companies have been captured by state institutions and how these company, smaller companies that are, that are not these global players but still have, have found their way into working with governments to amass a massive amount of information using proprietary systems that then they then rent due to governments. This is more and more, there's more and more of an extraction industry around data. So, this is what I'm going to talk about today, this evening. I think that, I don't know, up to, up to this point, this is um, six, six examples of, of things which I feel have captured a bare minimum of the things that I, that I am trying to, to speak about and have people more aware of. So, I'm going to quickly go through um, cases of this. This is... I don't know if everybody here may know of all these cases, but also to uh, hopefully inspire uh, that there is kind of a weight around um, this, uh, this acronym. So we are constantly being monitored. Our phones are like spies. Our cars have become tracking beacons. Right? And so we now find ourselves interacting with many proprietary systems. We find ourselves in Ubers, on Facebook, while, I don't know, momentarily checking to see if our Amazon package has arrived. But we are monitored all the time, and by different forces. So I talked about facial recognition in my last talk, but I, I think that we're going to see more and more of, of um, the phenomenon that's here in the, the lower right-hand corner, that now Google and Facebook are matching online uh, data with offline shopping habits. So going into stores, but also using uh, location services on your phone, being able to, to see if there's correlation between the ads they served you and your real IRL spending habits. We also are used to th people listening. We haven't really thought about it. We're being monitored. Facebook uh, Messenger is now going to try to do some, use some keywords. We've had anybody that's used Gmail for a while. They actually just stopped, but for a long time, our emails have been scanned to service targeted ads. Now the U.S. military wants to get up in Twitter. <sighs> kind of these fire hose um, APIs. Uh, the FBI couldn't get it for a while, but uh, or the CIA couldn't get it, but the FBI was able to get uh, this Firehose API, that now the world around us, uh, the, there's so real-time social, social media monitoring tools. I don't know if anybody, um, if all of y'all read the, the uh, ShareLabs report on uh, the hacking team metadata. 
it is an awesome read. It is really, an, it's an impressive report. It was really one of my favorite reports from last year, I believe. Um, they were able to go through, and so this is a, this is a graph of the uh, CEO of Hacking Team, his email frequency throughout the day. Just a small data set, but you can really get a picture of people's lives with something as simple as email metadata. Even as just like as the headers, right? You're able to see, okay, well then who are they contacting? What does this look like on a weekly, um, an hourly or weekly? And so these sophisticated photos or these sophisticated images of our lives can really, um, can really tell a large amount about us with not a lot of data. With indexing, our information is, is, is stored and then analysis are served and we're served not what we want, but what they think we want. And I think this is interesting. Once we're talking about these large data sets, how similar do we have to be to someone else in order to get served a similar ad? And I think that the lack of transparency and the nature of proprietary systems in which we're not able to look inside, we can't answer these questions. I don't, what is it that makes me a liberal or a moderate or a conservative? Am I more than the sum of my clicks? Before, be, just because I think, therefore I am? Is this still applicable? Or is it therefore I click? I click, therefore I am. And this is the relationship. This is the lack of a social contract between people and our technology that I think we have to continue to interrogate. Some of y'all probably heard that uh, Roomba was thinking about selling maps of people's homes. This is a Google uh, from last week, uh, from April, I break the story. It's, this to me is this nexus in which that we are no longer just online beings, that we're now online even if we're offline. There are some interesting uses to some of these things. That looking for spikes in search data for malaria or for symptoms. So Google is not doing it actually, is not, is not just using data of do I have malaria, it's I isolating the search terms that, from, that appear around malaria and then using them as indicators to look for outbreaks. Nifty, but also a bit invasive. Manipulation. Claudio Vecna, who uh, gave a talk yesterday, and I believe tomorrow, is, is launching a new project, facebook.tracking.exposed. And what that project is doing is it's a browser plugin, and it's looking at post IDs on Facebook and saying, how often does this one post show up when you log on to Facebook? This is a sort of data, uh, uh, data collection that I, I think that we can really help transparency efforts. We don't really know. We just see a feed and we, we don't know if we've seen it before. I never really look at ads and I really don't know if an ad has appeared there before, if that ad is, is, has, um, is, is there every day. But with, with tools, we're able to now see more and more about the ways in which that algorithms prioritize content and manipulate our feeds um, in a way that is not chronological, but what they think we want. So there was a really interesting case um, I've seen Ryan Robertson, and they wrote a number of pieces about this. Um, and they, they've coined this term, search engine manipulation effect, seem, and they were able to, um, around the, uh, around, they, they first did it in a, in a controlled environment, and then they also did this study uh, during the Indian elections, the elections in India in 2014, I believe, and um, were able to, to look at the ways in which that small differences in search engine feeds were able to change um, outcomes of elections. I was looking into, uh, around, the, around the US election, I was looking into writing a piece around the ways in which technology companies could influence our um, influence our democratic agency, let's say, our ability to feel that we are exercising our ability to vote for the person who we think we will do the best job. And I th this really stood out to me as one of the most persuasive cases. Maybe it's, it's less than a point in some cases, uh, yeah, less than 1%, but um, 
the, the, the science exists now. And so this is able to be replicated. And actually when I find it interesting that as these surveys or these, these research uh, projects are being done in academia, there's probably the same research being done at the campuses in Silicon Valley to see exactly what the, uh, what the effects are of, of things like a, a, a search feed. So that reports of uh, manipulates what's trending, um, who, how, the, how the information that gets to us. Uh, not so, I guess, a year, a year ago, um, Facebook changed the way uh, that they sorted things. Friends and family now. Advertisers weren't happy. And there's also a militarization going on around, around the influence of beliefs. We um, see uh, recently YouTube announced that using AI um, was more effective than humans when it comes to uh, having people, leading people away from terrorist content. So interception. Interception, granted, is maybe the, the weakest uh, letter, but I think it's uh, in, in my Mimics framework. But I think it's interesting because it shows that above any one system are higher powers. That things like PRISM um, has now been showed to, um, it, for, to be able to have massive amounts of upstream collection. That we are now, that, I mean, and this, I mean, if you think about it, PRISM costs $20 million a year which sounds kind of like a lot, but to be a spy on the whole world, <laughs> that is, if you, if you got the tap, if you're able to do this, like why would you, you not, yeah? And I mean, uh, consistently owning large platforms. Although I have to say that I like that AOL was one of the last uh, to be owned. So yeah, there's really, so I, I, I felt that like with this interception and the way in which the, the pictures that, especially if it's just meta, metadata being collected, um, especially if it's on US citizens that uh, falls outside of 702, that there's a lot of, that a lot of this is maybe not even direct information, but metadata that, yeah, email uh, headers are, are collected. But as Michael Hayden said, the former uh, NSA director, we kill people based on metadata. So this is deadly serious, that not, these are not just like, these are not just throw away parts of our, of our emails. These are not just ha casual conversation on Facebook. If you, were, uh, if you match the description of somebody on a kill list or a high, ta or high value target list, there may be a drone coming at your face based on your metadata. Wireless talking, people are finding, um, people are finding vulnerabilities in, in systems constantly. Um, in, in places, whether it's cell site simulators, stingrays, or, or just out of date, um, unpatched uh, telecommunications infrastructure, uh, there's more and more ability for the information that's collected proprietarily to, proprietarily to leak out. And even, and, and I think it's also pro very problematic when IoT devices that exist on a proprietary yet unsecured platform are susceptible to external attacks. Then there's also the state apparatus. Um, then Xinjiang province in western China, where the ethnic minority Uyghur group is, um, is a very restive area. And there's been a lot of, uh, kind of resettlement by Han Chinese, and so slowly the ethnic uh, majority has been, has been kind of pushed to the edges of society. Um, but they were actually uh, a couple of weeks ago um, and ha having checkpoints, stopping people on the road and making sure they had state spyware on their phone. Again, what happens at the edge of the earth in the most marginalized communities eventually finds its way back into us that have privilege. And then the courts are another like threat vector. When, when we have one warrant giving the authorization to hack many accounts, when, wi when warrantless requests um, are, are, are signed without looking, uh, all, all these things, it's, it's another ways in which that 
that we can be intercepted in the traffic even though we're, we're communicating in what seems to be a secure and proprietary way. Censorship is an issue that I work on quite a bit. I work as a product strategist for onlinecensorship.org. Um, it's a project begun by, uh, by a colleague, by my colleagues, uh, three years ago, I suppose. Um, feel free to follow us on Twitter. What we do is we have a survey that's been, uh, it's been online for about a year and a half now. And if your social media post has been taken down or if your account has been suspended, you can go onto our website, fill out a short survey, and we take this, these surveys and then uh, come aggregate it with other information that we track. We do a weekly takedown, which every week we put four stories up that made news around content moderation policies, um, or abuse content moderation policies. Um, and so within every six months or so, we write a report. Um, the last one's available on, on onlinecensorship.org. And what we're trying to do is in some ways uh, crowdsource transparency around platforms. If you're pl if you, we don't really know the uh, takedown, uh, the transparency reports are really slim. They, they give only a, a handful of indicators and it's very difficult to make, to draw any stories from these, from their transparency reports. So, because they're not giving us the information, we designed a way to, to have people report their information to us. Um, and censorship is um, both direct and indirect. Um, sometimes it can be, there can be abuse around censorship. So flagging, if a platform hasn't built in that 100 people flagging the same people's content at the same time, um, they've been built in for this, then maybe this content goes down until it's reviewed, but this can also be used uh, in abusive ways. Uh, Facebook, we've seen many cases in which that uh, content that did not uh, violate Facebook's terms of service was still taken down. Again, we work on, on reports and work with other organizations, but it's very difficult uh, for us to, to be completely thorough because this is still unscientific data. It's what's getting pushed to us. And so we try to uh, make recommendations to these companies. Transparency is always at the top of the list, but not just transparency, but enhanced transparency reporting because without, without, tra without solid transparency reporting, it's very difficult to know what's going on on a platform that like two billion people are using every month. So this is what I was talking about earlier. So Google's like, hey, don't worry about it, humans. We're gonna let our AI take on the terrorists. Well, who's reviewing, right? Is there any external review? Is there a public editor, an ombudsman, that's able to step into this proprietary AI process and say, oh, actually, a human would not find this offensive, only a machine. And the final letter, siloing. So there's been quite a bit of talk this week. I've been in multiple conversations about the idea of data portability. But I think one of the issues right now is, I, well, I work on uh, ideas around community archives, but also long-term archives. How do we create a, ros a digital Rosetta Stone that can last 20 years or 200 years? Is it possible to build anything digital that can last 2,000 years? Well, as long as the information that we have that we, that we accumulate on a massive scale every day, all our Facebook likes, our, our Facebook content, all our search results, all this ephemeral media that exists only inside the proprietary platform that is not exportable, if this only exists there, if tomorrow Facebook goes down, what happens to this shared digital cultural record of us? What if you're not on Facebook? The inability for interoperability is also concerning. If you get kicked off of Facebook, you can't comment on certain websites. If you get uh, kicked off YouTube, and aren't able to, or Twitter, uh, Twitter people have had been hard banned. There's a few people that, uh, most of them were pretty shitty people. But it also goes to show if companies are able to target individuals, then they are able to eliminate them from a process. And especially if these platforms say to be representative of democratic values and norms, Facebook has a live town halls for the US election, Twitter also live stream debates. And so while these companies are 
are saying that they are participating in, the de in enabling democracy, they're also institutionalizing walls, walled gardens, which keep people, some, some people out. So as we, so as we see more of in-app in -app browsing from Facebook and things like AMP, um, as, as more and more as, we, as URLs are decreased, this is also changing the way in which that we can revisit the same web page twice. If something doesn't have a URL, how can, how, can, how can we send it to the Internet Archive? If it just exists inside of a browsing space, a browsing ecosystem inside of Facebook. Again, there's plans, personalized Googles, from uh, my colleague Jillian York, uh, who's written, written about this extensively, that both professionally and personally, um, a ban uh, can, can impact our lives. So I'm not going to say that I completely agree with this, but I think it's an interesting, uh, different, uh, an interesting uh, angle to look at this. It, it's not that computers are too smart about to take over the world, but they're too stupid, and, and they're here. And so I think that this is, to me, this is one of the, the philosophical questions that we need to ask ourselves. Are computers smart? Is artificial intelligence really, is artificial intelligence really intelligent? Or are the motives of those who control these proprietary systems actually the things that are creating this change. Um, I'm going to talk so much about biases, but it's a really big topic. And um, I want to give some examples about the ways in which that more and more these, these proprietary systems and platforms are going to impede on our lives. So, Yahoo was just, which was just acquired um, by a large um, ISP in the U.S. Um, media company. There's now there's now um, smart billboards. So this is actually from a, a year and a half ago, a couple of years ago. But I think it's also important to remember uh, when we're talking about massive amounts of data or patents, for this matter, that this data can pass through a chain of custody. That if Yahoo gets bought by Time Warner. That what ha like we're, there is not a social contract or even or privacy protections in place in order to ensure that our data still falls within the original uh, data terms and conditions. <sighs> I don't know what to say about digital assistants. I don't really get them, but evidently. I don't know, there was 300,000 of them sold or something on Prime Day through Amazon, so they're here and every, many people have a, yeah, straight up a spy in their living room now. The IoT space, not really something that I fuck with, but suffice to say, it's a clusterfuck. I think a big part of finding solutions to this, I believe, is examining who is making the technology, why are they making the technology, who was it for, and how long is it meant to last? Kate Crawford, who's a friend and quasi colleague, well, working in the same space, has written extensively about this. Um, but I think that if we look at if we look at who is creating technology, who is build who's creating technology, and who is affected by technology, it's 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 difficult. Why is it that a core, that one in four Black Americans have faced uh, race-based harassment online? I'm not saying there's correlation, but I think it's interesting that if you look at the policy teams and the engineering teams of these companies, especially Silicon Valley companies, you're not going to find a lot of black Americans on these teams. So what are, whose opinion, whose life experience, whose background are we taking into account when we're designing these proprietary systems? Cars, 
our self-driving cars more and more are going to be around. But I'm going to close with, a, with um, a few last points, and then if anybody has any questions. So I think it's important for us to realize that even though many people here at this camp and in our communities are open source until they die, that floss is king, that these sort of things, that many people and a critical mass of people are still going to exist inside of these proprietary technologies. A second point is due to trade secret laws and speech is code, or sorry, code is speech in the US, that there are already judicial protections granted to technology companies to keep their proprietary algorithms and platforms classified as trade secrets. It's not by accident, I believe, that these that there is such little transparency. If we were to pull back behind the curtain and somehow be able to see inside the decision-making processes of, of the, the newest technology rolling out, it would probably be a wake-up call. But because we can't see inside, we only see the influence that we're, or the epistemic reality that we get from using these platforms. And that, in some way, is kind of like blinders, that we are not able to see left or right, but just straight ahead into the screen. That every day, these messages that are being reinforced, whether it's politics or music or fashion, that all of these things slowly influence and nudge our agency and create uh, a perception of what we are expected to do. The data, data is the future. I don't think, for us, but like companies now, the, the valuation of startups in, in Silicon Valley is really wild. I mean, there's tens of millions of dollars fl floating around to potential startups, and so many of them have data, and invasive data, intimate data collection as a revenue model. Finally, we, I, I believe we need to demand more from our machines, by the people that make our machines, the people that sell our machines, and finding new ways to encourage algorithm transparency. I think that transparency is such a big part of this, but also user control. Also, things like forward consent, things like uh, differential privacy settings. But finally, we need to also find ways to rethink, re, re, to rethink the financial evaluation of these companies. How is Google worth a quarter or half a trillion dollars? Yes, it's a service and it makes our lives easier, but this is wrath of God money. So I believe we have to do something or the future will be written for us. That failure to change the course of current technology and trends could make, could create a system in which that as more and more people come online, as the next billion people come online and are in instantly connected to these information vacuums masquerading as phone apps, that we're, we can see more and more replication of historical inequalities, of, of bias, that socioeconomic status will continue, or will, the technology will not help us gain an increased quality of life and more prosperity, but will keep us in a bubble based on who they think we are. These proprietary technologies are very capable of undermining democratic institutions. Who saw Brexit coming? Who saw the election of the current American president? Some people did, but Nobody on my Facebook wall. It's really interesting to, to think that this is when thing very, that we're able to see these processes in, in such a powerful way. How could it be that even though I've never seen a pro-Brexit Facebook post and seen hundreds and hundreds of anti-Brexit Facebook posts, that there's these, these people out there that I am so insulated from but still exist? 
what does that mean? What is, do I, are, do we live, do I live in the same society as somebody else in my same country if my Facebook feed tells a complete opposite picture of the world as theirs? The amplification of a global technolo technological hegemony. That now the rise of the technology corporation to rival the nation state. Said, who do you want on your side in a war? Google or Canada? Not talking shit about Canada, but I think it's important that we, that we say, okay, what, how powerful are all these technology companies? Finally, I'm, re I'm also concerned about removal of humans as the primary, pri primary decision-making force. Let's just say that human out of the loop, society out of the loop. We're already seeing Israel, Russia, and China work on lethal autonomous weapon systems that are truly, anonymous, uh, truly, truly autonomous. That without any human input, there's a kill list input into the system. Maybe, and some maybe gather in, in part from Facebook posts, check ins, or Google GPS data. So, what can we do? I think that we have to work um, in a way to communicate things to make people realize that they do not have confidentiality of movement or association or communication. How can we create privacy as a default? I think that in this community as well, that we've seen one of the places which privacy is truly appreciated. But we have to do more. We have to create more robust strategies to let people outside of our communities know that this is not just a, a, a risk of data falling into the wrong hands, but a, we, have, we run the risk of creating a society not built on individual agency, but by technological determinism. Do more, build systems, tools, and processes that enable users to reference personal data collected by platforms. How can I, uh, <laughs> yeah, how can we, how can we, advocate to enable Facebook and Google's and the other platforms out there to let us know what they know about us. We need to increase algorithm transparency and increase control over the portability of data. Confederated federated systems uh, or, or networks uh, that allow us to traverse our platforms. So much to do to prov uh, support platforms to provide information free of censorship. I watched you know, attentively to the kind of the, the jump from Twitter to Mastodon not long ago, and I, 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 the conversations going around that of why Twitter was no longer the place for many people uh, was quite fascinating. And I think that this kind of gets to this of, of censorship, the freedom to, to instance and and work in a decentralized fashion. And I think we need to do more to increase the confidence and the integrity and security of data as it's stored, stay, saved, and transmitted. So the whole life cycle of data. Not just thinking about data as something that exists when I take a selfie, not thinking about data just as something that exists when I'm searching results, uh, but thinking about data as something that is a continuum, that even though it was like this, it had this meaning to us when we put it in the cloud, the cloud may have also been creating its own thoughts about the same, same image as long as it's been there. So one more time, mimics, hashtag, monitor, index, manipulate, intercept, censor, and silo. I'm not saying it's the best catch-all or it's the most catchy thing, but uh, it's been a pleasure to present this concept uh, to y'all tonight. Um, and this is the end of my talk. I would, yeah, if anybody has any questions, I'd love to answer. Um, again, my name is Matthew Stender, my Twitters, and um, I'll keep this screen up here. Da. Thank you very much.
So please come up to the stage for questions. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Barry. Uh, this uh, mimics. Um, it's uh, disturbing. Uh, but there's one more thing that I would uh, like your view about, which is uh, shills on Twitter. Like, it's not trolls who are uh, engaging in a um, conversation, but more people who are, you know, they are trying to manipulate the conversation, but not in a fair way. They're doing it in a systematical way. Uh, they're kind of altering the topics. Uh, you know, it's just not, it's not, sometimes they appear to be bots. Sometimes they appear to be human or you just don't know, of course. What's your view on that, Shields? I would say, if anything, I would put this into the manipulation category. That the idea of a, a platform being manipulated, not by state actors or the platform itself, but by a subset of user base. I, I think that Twitter is... I don't know. Sometimes I, I read below and I'm like, I, yeah, I can't tell if these are people or bots or what. I think as more, I think as more and more countries engage in psychological operations, as psyops become more of a, of a as a, a protected warfare technique again, we're seeing this rise with, you know, Macedonian bot nets and, and these sort of things that we have to l we have to do a few things. One, we have to be, get better at spotting or discarding or being able to have better tools to block certain users. Perhaps think about if enough people block something or block one user, can they get reviewed and then be, you know, is there, is there a, a process involved to, for a more of a, temp, like a temporary or, or a block um, if they're engaging in malicious behavior? Um, but when it comes to actually the changing of the conversation, I, I, I think on one hand, there are people that are being employed to do this. Uh, Samantha B, who is, a, is an American comedian, has a, or a Canadian comedian who has a show in the US, um, actually interviewed some Russian trolls. And they, they were talking about why they did it. It was kind of for the lulls. Um, and I think there's a South Park episode as well. I don't know if you've seen that, uh, where there's a character that basically is a, is a troll. But, do, but I think it's the... I mean, it's what, are, what, are, what is the motive behind inaction? And I think sometimes it's very hard to tell. Sometimes we just see gibberish. And so I think if there is it derailing, is it to create static in this conversation? Is it to divert topics? And so I feel with some, with some ways we need to look at the, the motive. I think it's to distract uh, other users who are not, you know, if it's a controversial subject, like you and me talk about, and then he's overhearing that, and they probably wouldn't know that that shield is uh, you know, just trying to uh, make that conversation less interesting. Yeah, I, I, I'm in some ways, I think that it is also up to us engaging in conversations to have a well enough thought through, or it helps if we have a well thought through uh, if what we post, we stand behind, and if it's robust enough to not be able to be derailed, right. I, I think that we should strive to that. I don't know if we're ever going to be able to get shrills or trolls off, because where do you draw the line? What is, what is the difference between me on a snarky day, or I'm whiskey drunk, and just like, yeah, just, you know, and then somebody that is, you know, sitting in, in Belarus. So uh, for me, as far as advocating for transparency and free and open pl or platforms free of censorship. Um, I, I f find the troll problem, if not the troll problem, like the troll problem very interesting because where, who gets to call it a troll? And I think the same way with, with that, I would just say that if we're able to create new platforms that are decentralized and we have more micro granular control um, over who is allowed into these sub more curated communities, that's an alternative, but on, an open, on a platform like Twitter, I, I don't really have a solution. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, practically speaking... Get, get closer to the oh, mic, sorry, please. Oh, sorry, absolutely. Uh, practically speaking, um, where, how do you see the solution? In policy, in us demanding more openness, especially if you consider the conflict of interest that both you know, commercial companies have, but also states 
and in some cases those states are not even in our control. So how do you see that? Well, I, right now the, the geopolitical landscape, I see Europe as a leader. I think that the GDPR, if we're able to use even strategic litigation inside of, under that framework, uh, that the European courts have shown to be much more sympathetic to people, not corporations. Um, so I think that um, on the policy side, that now is actually a very interesting time to lobby uh, Brussels. Um, I think that you're already gearing up for strategic litigation um, once it's passed, and particularly things like the right to explanation. I think this is a very interesting uh, policy framework in which that has not really been included in any other um, governing uh, data, yeah, information regulations that, that I'm aware of. And to me, this idea in which that a policy mandating the track backableness of a decision to its, com its uh, component parts is actually a very powerful mechanism to ensure at least a chain of custody that we're comfortable with. To be able to somehow not just have arbitrary artifacts in a machine learning process or an algorithmic process, but to really be able to look back and see where at what chain it was broken or what chain where uh, what at what what uh, argumentative you know network things were going on. I, I so policy. Uh, strategic litigation. Um, I do think it's more and more data stories around really painting a picture. The Intercept had a really interesting piece a couple of years ago about the revolving door between Silicon Valley and Washington, D.C. And so I think that more projects that visually map out the number of former Googlers in the White House or the number of State Department folks now, you know, running uh, policy directors at, at Facebook is also an interesting way to, to do network mapping um, and help us understand how intertwined are these things. That's part of it. We don't actually know who, where all, and all the, the, the motivations and interests that, the, that the, both the state and corporations have, some of them are playing the long game. They have not even... Man, they have not even matured in their plans. And so I think that the more we can do to, to make people aware about who are running the companies, we know cabinet members um, and cabinet, yeah, in, in governments, but beyond Mark Zuckerberg, how many people's names do we know at Facebook? Or beyond Smiths and you know, people, how many in Page, like how many people do we know at, at, at Google? And so I think it's also about elevating the profiles and putting a little more heat on, on people that are in these companies to let them know that they're not just uh, making these decisions in darkness, but that the world is watching them. Sure, but I, I, I think in general that addresses results, right? Things that we, we actually get to know on. It's, it's all the stuff that we don't know, all the, the huge amount of data that they're collecting and they're making decisions on that is either in our benefit or not, it, you know, there, there, there is benefits for them to, be, to have it done in our benefits as well. Um, but there's no way to control that. And I think it's going to be extremely hard to, um, either through policy or, or, you know, except we, when we do journalistic uh, uh, infiltration or something like that, to actually get that type of information uh, outside. I would say, I would have said maybe two years ago, if we were here, that advertisers and lobbying of, of boards of directors, but advertisers in particular, might be a strategic way in order to influence the course of the, 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 the company. But now Facebook and Google together have like 90% of the digital advertising market captured between their duopoly. And so I think that we're actually losing a little way to actually use economic or traditional market-based solutions to, to nudge these companies. I think they're actually, with co content collapse in the West, like they're actually now the emerging markets are really where they're focusing. So I think it's also important for us to get ahead and work in advocacy um, and information training in India and Bangladesh and Central Africa and places like this in which there's large populations and through free basics, uh, the free uh, zero rated uh, Facebook internet um, and other things where these things are going to roll out that we need to be ahead of the curve and already have strategies in place to roll to be working with local organizations on the ground to at least have people be aware of what does it mean when you log into Facebook because I think the transparency around the terms of service and actually what it this legalese of what they what it sounds like they're collecting and actually how much information they have is 
uh, is, is frightening. So I, uh, we're the online censorship.org project um, that I'm involved with. We are, our platform is available in English, Spanish, Arabic, and Portuguese maybe, I don't know. So we're, even in that, we've, we've tried to create a multilingual framework to capture as many people and as we, as we go on to translate in more languages. Um, so I think it's also about, as activists, if we create tools to make sure that these are available not just to our communities, but to the world at large. Next question, please, from the mic in the back. Perfectly. Um, thank you first very much for the interesting presentation. Uh, basically, you give already the answer to my question, but I try uh, um, it another way. Um, it is interesting to see that even for a person like you are, uh, which is aware of the mechanism on the platforms, that a stream of text in front of your eyes makes you still questioning your perception of reality uh, in, in both two ways, like bots created content versus real person's opinion and your perception of experiencing um, opinions versus opinions you can't verify but being confronted with in your stream. And um, you answered already, where do you see um, some interesting activities you would like to raise awareness on, practically, for us, where we can join and amplify them? Um, well, I can encourage everybody to uh, uh, check out the new project that I mentioned earlier, Facebook Tracking Exposed. Um, it's a browser plugin, and uh, that information is able to be used to analyze patterns of how, which creates a record of the post ID, and then every time you're on Facebook, it collects them. And so one of the interesting applications of that is to figure out, are there any interesting data stories that we can extrapolate from the number of posts, even though every, on, the, on a daily basis? On Sundays, do we get more ads? Or around election time, do we, you know, are a few key people in our, in our feed uh, getting pushed to us on a, you know, hourly basis? Um, so I think that transparency around the, the algorithmic uh, sorting um, is quite interesting. Um, OnlineCensorship.org uh, is, again, to plug, <laughs> plug my project, um, but we have, this, uh, we have a survey that people can fill in, so if you ever see anybody on Facebook saying their post has been taken down, especially erroneously, uh, it, it would be great if you could you know, send them the link, um, and we're really trying to, to ca capture as many stories and then turn those into reports and policy, um, policy proposals or policy recommendations. Um, yeah, I think like new platforms like Mastodon and other places, which that like if we're able to create a critical mass on on open source platforms um, or, or much more open, unproprietary platforms, then it gives them more legitimacy. And if we're able to create platforms that are not reliant on traditional advertising models or on proprietary closed platforms um, that people can instance, create new instance, instances for themselves um, and it doesn't have to be a, a top down, then this idea is legitimized more in the eyes of Silicon Valley. That people say, oh wow, we've, well, Mastodon got this big without really any VC funding how could that happen? And so I think that we also need to show that there is, that, that us as, as people that are thinking progressively about these issues, that we do not adhere to the traditional value um, in which these platforms think that they give us. That our value is actually in privacy, that this is something we, probably, uh, we, we, we value. That the lack of censorship on platforms is something that we value, that we're going to have our voice heard there. And so I think that also, while well, raising up alternative platforms and engaging um, and um, working to, to create uh, or be a part of the systems or the, the platforms that we want um, gives them uh, increased legitimacy and visibility that hopefully will sink into the minds of those that are funding um, platforms and, and the places that they're form funded. Um, I myself never had a Facebook account, never used it, um, but uh, thank you very much for raising the awareness because that's, that's basically my argument uh, to people. Uh, once you would know what's really gong, uh, going on on there or what's the purpose, you would not use it anymore and that's basically your expression. You supported that very well. Thank you very much. Welcome. Any more questions from the audience? We still enjoy a minute for question. No? 
Um, thank you all very much. Uh, it was a, it was a pleasure being here tonight. Thank you very much, also, Matthew.